Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our workshop, uh, the public interface of the Life Sciences Workshop, When Science and Citizens Connect, uh, Public Engagement on Genetically Modified Organisms. Um, I don't have a lot of announcements um, to make about, uh, I'll, I'll talk in a second once my slides are up. Um, I'll talk about uh, the, the round table and, and our workshop a little bit more. Uh, we'll have uh, one and a half days of uh, lively discussions. As I mentioned to some of you over breakfast this morning, uh, for those of you who have been on the planning calls, um, those were about as lively as any planning call that I've ever been on. <laughs> so if this, if this meeting um, is only half as, as spirited, um, we'll, we'll um, have lots of interesting um, discussions, uh, put it that way. Um, I want to talk really quickly for the first half hour or so um, about a little bit of a framework of how we're thinking not just about the workshop uh, but also within the roundtable. Um, so tell you a little bit about, about what we do as part of the roundtable, why we're here today in particular for this workshop, why are we still talking about GMOs. This is uh, certainly not a, a new issue, um, and, but then also walk you through a few themes that I think you will hear again and again and again for the next day and a half. Um, and, and different people, different speakers will look at this from very different perspectives, and I think we'll have to have some real in-depth discussions about, about some of these issues. Um, and then just uh, mention a few things about, about the structure and, 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 the, and the idea. Uh, <coughs> Behind, behind the three days, the way we've, we've broken them down. But um, really quickly about PILS. Um, PILS is a, is a round table that, is, that came out of the, the, the natural sciences. It's a round table that didn't come out of the social science, out of the behavioral <laughs> sciences, but it's a round table that came out of the natural sciences and, and, and basically was created um, with, with the idea that we're increasingly moving or maybe not increasingly, maybe it's always been this way, but there's an increasing awareness um, that a lot of the, the emerging technologies at the, at the, uh, in the life sciences are emerge for most citizens at this interface of science and society. A lot of the issues um, that come up are issues that are inherently issues at the science society interface. They, 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 they maybe create concerns. They, they certainly have created lots of policy debates. Um, have influenced markets and, and some of the background materials that you've read um, or that you are reading or that you might still read for tomorrow um, for the breakout sessions um, have touched on that. What we do is not, is, is, is different from, from um, let's say, some of the consensus reports that are being written. We're really more of a convening body, uh, the public interfaces of the Life Sciences Roundtable. Uh, so we convene public discussions um, and workshops like this. We really see ourselves, and, and I think our role is within the academies, uh, one of, of convening conversations rather than uh, making um, statements, public, public statements. Um, this workshop is one of those um, areas where we felt that there's a, there's a, a, a need to, to convene a conversation um, in 2015, again, even though um, GMOs, as I said, has been on the public agenda or have been on the public agenda for a long, for a long time. Um, what we want to touch on is really, is really three things broadly related to public interfaces surrounding the life science. And by public interfaces, really, I mean very broadly construed any area where the science of GMOs connects with its societal, its societal applications, its societal political impacts. Um, you'll hear this morning um, from myself, uh, from a number of other speakers who I'll introduce as, as, as we go along, and I will not spend, and we throughout the day and a half spend a lot of time introducing speakers. You have, and if you don't have it yet, at the uh, check-in table you can get a handout and we sent it around, um, it's online as well, with people's um, extensive biographies, so I'd, I'd urge you to look at those. But you'll hear from a lot of speakers about the general principles. What do we know from social, from behavioral sciences about how those interfaces work? Uh, we've spent a lot of time I think winging it in the area of science and society. Trying out what could work, what might work, how can we build better interfaces, but there's actually a body of, of social science literature that we want to go through and, and also empirical findings, um, especially in the areas of GMOs. What do we know from surveys, from, from other types of social science data about how the public reacts to different aspects, what some of these interfaces are, how we can build better science public interfaces. Um, 
looking very carefully also, as, you, as you've seen on the program, at the, at the labeling debate. And we'll, we'll have a panel discussion um, surrounding that. The third and the last part um, tomorrow will deal with, with the workshop part. We're really trying to workshop more effective interfaces in the life sciences. We have three different case studies um, and background materials, and um, each one of you has a little dot on your, on your, um, um, uh, on your tag that will tell you which, uh, which session. I think most of you have one and not everybody. Never mind, um, not all of you. So I, I just faked all of you into looking at your name tag. <laughs> um, um, but it, it was still interesting to see everybody look at that name tag. And, um, so my apologies for, <laughs> for that. Um, but one way or the other, we'll have three, three breakout groups dealing with, uh, with, the, uh, um, with those different. And Dan Kahan just walked in, so that makes me really happy because he's a speaker in one of our morning sessions. Um, <laughs> But so why are we here today, especially for GMOs? And I, and I, and I want to just give you two slides really quickly um, uh, to, to show you why we're still having these debates and, 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 and what, some of the, what some of the issues are. Number one is it's a highly politicized issue. And in that respect, it, it is not any different from most emerging technologies that we're, that we're seeing. It's an issue, yes, that is, that is very important from a scientific perspective. But it's an issue that in the minds of most Americans or many Americans and certainly a lot of Europeans is, is one that has a lot of political implications in terms of regulatory implications and, and other implications. Um, and we've certainly seen Greenpeace um, very successfully communicate some of those um, issues. And this was Germany um, just because I grew up there. Um, a lot of these issues um, tend to, a lot of these emerging technologies tend to, to really have, a, a, a share a number of characteristics. Um, and some people have talked about this as post-normal science. So science where the decision stakes are extremely high, but also the system's uncertainties, the, the, the uncertainty surrounding the political system, and some of, the, some of the risks related to technologies tend to be fairly high, at least, and again, we need to distinguish this in consumers' minds or in, 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 in the minds of various different publics. They see the science as highly complex, something that many of us haven't learned about in school. Um, they see a science that's moving extremely fast, um, a science where the bench bedside transition is, is faster than it's been in, in the past. And GMOs are a good example. I think there are even better ones more recently if that's nanotechnology or others. Uh, but more importantly, and this is a theme that we need to really keep in mind for the next few days or for the next couple of days, um, that the ethical, legal, and social implications, so what's often described as ELSI, um, of these issues are at least as important for most consumers and for many members of various publics um, as are as the scientific aspects of the issue. So if we, if we can and should patent genes is probably as important or is an, an issue maybe more important to some consumers um, as safety is as other scientific aspects of the issue. So we're really talking about a unique or, or at least a, 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 a set of aspects of these new issues that are, that are, that are different from from maybe some signs that we've seen in the past. And this is partly why we're here and why we've seen statements from a number of folks out of the Academy's leadership and elsewhere um, talking about public interfaces, about scientists themselves communicating um, with the public, seeking those public interfaces. Um, Alan Leshner, um, now former CEO, I guess, of, uh, of AAAS, um, has argued that we, as a result, need an honest bi-directional dialogue and we'll hear a little bit of what that can mean as, a, as an interface. And then, of course, Larry Page, um, I think, uh, talked about a marketing problem for science, which, again, that term may have been somewhat unfortunate. But the second part of that statement is maybe more important when he talked to AAAS in San Francisco, and that is science having to get involved in politics, in business, and, and in the media um, if they want to have and, and create successful public interfaces. So that gets me to the third part, and that is I want to talk a little bit and, and spend a few minutes just talking through um, a few, a few uh, intuitive assumptions, a few themes that I think have come up over the last few years if we've been talking about public interfaces again and again, and where all of us have some intuitive idea of how those things work out, but a lot of our intuitive ideas, um, unfortunately or fortunately, are not true. Um, and there's social science to tell us if they're, um, if they're true or not. And the first one is the idea that, that knowledge is really at the center of everything. 
Um, I think we've had some of these discussions on our planning calls. That's the idea of, well, they just don't know. Problem with public interfaces is the public doesn't know anything about GMOs. And there's certainly some truth about certain groups among the public or in the public not knowing all that much about GMOs, but it's not news to most of us that that's not just true for GMOs, that's true for everything else. Um, Two-thirds of the American public cannot accurately place on election day the two presidential candidates relative to one another on gun control who has more or less restrictive stances. That's never going to change, and it's never going to change for GMOs either. The tricky part with that argument, though, is that, that it has led us to do a very particular type of outreach or a very particular type, look for a particular type of public communication. And whichever label you want to put on it, it's always the same. They're either called knowledge deficit models, they're called, um, people have talked about the familiarity hypothesis, other things. The assumption is twofold. Number one, if people were more informed, they would ultimately be more supportive of the science. Uh, that's assumption number one. And number two, as a result, what we need to do is we need to go out and, and, and just get more knowledge in the system. And then things will be better for science. The tricky part with it is it's unfortunately not true. Empirically, it's not true. Um, I wish it was true. I mean, normatively, we all want to believe this. Um, but empirically, it's not true. Just because people know more or learn more doesn't mean they become more supportive in science. In fact, some of that can have a, a, a boomerang effect and actually produce the opposite effects. And, it's, and the, 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 the psychology behind this is, is in motivated reasoning, something that we all use all the time. Um, I put a picture up here from you know, another prediction of when the world ends because those groups tend to use motivated reasoning a lot because they have to rearrange their reality every time it doesn't happen. But we all do that to a degree. Basically, what we do is we weigh information more heavily that's in front of us that fits our pre-existing beliefs, that fits our hypotheses. Um, and we weigh less heavily information that doesn't fit. Um, that's what we all constantly do. That's why it's called motivated reasoning. The, the outcome of that, and we've shown this study after study after study, different people have shown this, the exact same piece of scientific information means very different things to different people, which seems impossible. But it is true. Let me just show you one graph, and you'll see plenty of those over the next day and a half, um, that we did for stem cell research, where we group people on the x-axis and people who know a lot and people who know very little about stem cell research. This, we're not asking them, do you know a lot or do you know a little? We give them a little quiz, and they have to give scientifically correct answers, true or false answers. Um, this is what happens. Um, this is for people who are less religious. The more they know, yes, the more supportive they become of embryonic, embryonic stem cell research. So there's a slight upward slope. Um, but for people who are highly religious, that flatlines. This is not about them not knowing. This is not about them not getting the sign. These people just answered all the questions correctly. It simply means that whatever they know, they don't translate necessarily into a po more positive attitude. So in other words, the exact same knowledge means different things to different groups based on their prior values, their prior, their prior beliefs, and so on and so forth. And again, this is not them. This is not the public out there. This is all of us. All of us will make similar decisions. All of you will walk out of this after this talk or after another talk and will have different interpretations of what you heard, how good it was, how competent it was. That's not because you heard a different talk, because you all heard me say the exact same thing but it's because you came to this room with different priors, with different prior beliefs, values, and so on. So that's number one, a, a big principle that it's not just about knowledge. And in fact, the exact same piece of information may produce different outcomes. Number two, an argument that we hear again and again, it's all about trust. It's, it's that declining trust in science um, that, that, that's really our problem. If, they just, if, if, if we didn't have that declining level of trust, um, then we would ha wouldn't have that problem. Well, let me just show you what a lot of the studies that, that have talked about this phenomenon use general social science survey, uh, 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 general, uh, uh, the, the GSS, the, the, the general uh, uh, social survey, um, to, to track trust over time. I just plotted from the 80s, mid early 80s, to, uh, to 2010 here, trust in the press. And people, this is just plotting people. Who, trust, who have a great deal of confidence in the people running these institutions. So the press being one, and you'll see some decline overall. has never been really that high. Um, organized religion, um, just as something that some people sometimes um, plot against science. And then, the sci and then the scientists or scientists. And there is really no major decline overall. 
Um, there are peaks, there are valleys, but, but overall the level stays pretty stable. And in fact, it's again higher than a lot of other institutions. More importantly, and so this is taken from a survey on nanotechnology, where we ask people, who do you trust as an information source about this new technology? And again, if you look at the, the different numbers, I've just sorted them here, they get them randomly to avoid order effects. Um, here are the news media. Um, here are industry scientists, even industry scientists being fairly high in that group, and here are university scientists. So as far as the, 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 the level of trust that's brought to us as, as university and even industry scientists, it's fairly high, and it's high than, higher than most other institutions. So again, the argument that our communication problem, our interface problem, is a trust problem um, is at least, as far as levels go, not correct. And I know we'll hear from a number of speakers uh, more on this later on, but again, that, that general myth that it's just declining levels of trust is just simply empirically um, not true. The third assumption that we're often making is, or that we often make, is the idea that um, the public doesn't think like scientists, and that's our problem. They should think more like scientists. And the tricky part with that is, is two things. One, scientists don't think like scientists especially when it comes to the ethical, the legal, the social implications of, of their work. Um, we interview on a regular basis the leading scientists in different fields. They are surveyed, they are sampled based on, on impact factors, on, on web of science ratings. So we really take the most productive and most highly cited scientists from, from specific areas. And we ask them questions, among other things, do you think that nano research should be regulated? So we ask them essentially the policy, the public and policy interfaces of their work. And we predict that with, with different characteristics, so one of them or with different um, other variables. So we ask them, for example, what do you think the risks are related to the technology you're working on? We ask them batteries of 10, 20 questions of risks and benefits. We build indices and then we correlate those. And as you see in a, in a debate as overall positive, the more risk scientists see, um, the more they think regulations um, are necessary. And that's a good professional judgment, right? And the interesting thing is after you control out all of these things, after you control out field, how long they've been in the field, meaning seniority and so on, their personal ideologies also predict where they, what, what, their, what their stances are in regulation. So in other words, the idea that we all use shortcuts or that we all use our prior beliefs to make judgments, yes, we do. And scientists do too when they're asked to talk about the policy implications. So the idea that we can, have, that we can ask the general public to make scientific judgments or to really only think scientifically when thinking about the political impl implications or the social implications of technology is just naive because we as scientists don't do it either. Um, and I think that's an important takeaway. So what do we all do? We basically are all cognitive misers. We all have way too much information to process, to, to use, to in-depth process all of it. We make thousands of decisions every day. Um, we cannot use all available information for every single decision that we use. It's just not possible. So as a result, what we do is we, we rely on what political science has called low information rationality, meaning it's rational for most of us to not seek out all information that's out there. It's rational for us to rely on prior beliefs. It's rational for us to, to believe in partisanship as a shortcut um, to help us make decisions, and, and that's exactly what we do. Um, Shortcuts, our, our ideologies, our values, our, our prior beliefs become, become replacements for information, or at least ways of quickly judging um, information. And, and that has implications for GMOs in particular. Let me just show you one example about, uh, of, uh, from, from media research that we know heavily shapes people, people's views, and that's what's called cultivation. All of our views of reality, if we like it or not, are heavily shaped by, me by media portrayals of them. Why? Because most of us, especially for science, never have access to scientists one-on-one. -on -one. We've never seen people work inside a lab. And when I say us, this room is totally atypical. Um, but 325 Amer million Americans, most of them have never seen the inside of a lab. They don't know how scientists work. Um, they, for the first time they heard about nanotechnology was in Terminator 3, which is why I put that picture up. That's where their first image comes from. And you're chuckling, but that's actually exactly where the first, where the first contact with a new technology came from. And the mention of, of biotechnology or whatever else uh, may come up. This is where they get the image of scientists. Sheldon Cooper on, on, uh, on Big Bang Theory. Or um, if you remember way back when, Back to the Future, whenever that was in the, in the, in the early 80s. The interesting thing is, again, 
we're talking about different publics and 325 million Americans. I teach a 200 people class. It's a class that's mostly, that mostly draws STEM students um, at Wisconsin. Um, and as part of that class, what I ask them at some point is I ask them for five words to describe a scientist to me. These are people who are pre-med, who are genetics, who are double majors in various fields. Um, and I ask them, tell me what a scientist looks like. And they should really describe themselves. What they're describing is this. So when you put the five <laughs> words that everybody puts together, <laughs> this is the wordle that you get. And then you, you show them that wordle, and they're saying, no, 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 that's not what we meant. But that's exactly what's in their heads, right? So this is, this is what we're talking about to, uh, for, for media effects and, and how heavily or how strongly it shapes our, our, our perceptions. And I mean, every word in there, not every word, but most of them are truly depressing. Um, <laughs> and um, so that brings us to the, the last assumption, and that's the idea. And this is a really important one, because we're going to get sucked back into this one over the next day and a half. The assumption that we think we have some form of communication monopoly when it comes to new technologies. That if science speaks, the public will listen, or different publics will listen. And the answer is, that's not the case. Um, and we've, we've developed this over time, right? This is the knowledge deficit model that I told you earlier. We know it better, we give them knowledge, and then kind of a lecture hall model. That's this knowledge deficit. And, and, and once they know, then they'll, they'll make better decisions. With they being as undefined as it sounds right now, that was part of that model. The second model, and this is a little bit going back to this idea of a, of a bi-directional dialogue, was this, this more public engagement model. So we have a dialogue. Again, we as science talking to different groups in the, in the public. Um, and some of the work that, that you know, we're seeing out of, out of uh, SUNY Albany and others kind of follows that model. Well, if we just bring in an actor and we, we're kind of figuring out how to do improv and we're and, and then we have a better conversation with the public. Again, the assumption is that's really just a problem with how we communicate as scientists. Um, and, and, and ultimately, if we, if we communicate better, then we can tell people um, what, uh, what will work better. Well, the, the reality, unfortunately, or fortunately, is this. And the reality is that, yes, there is a communication, hopefully, between science and the public. Yes, there are these interfaces. But these interfaces work in a much broader set of social settings. Um, they work in highly politicized contexts. That's why I put, again, the Greenpeace demonstrations down there. Um, they work in realities that are, to a large degree, mediated. And I'll just show you some examples from GMOs in a second. Um, and in a socio-political context that we really need to understand. Because we're just one of many voices out there on the issue of GMOs. And very often, we may not be perceived as the most credible voice or as the most convincing voice one way or the, the, or the other, unless we manage to really position ourselves well in that overall environment. And that's not going to change either. It's not something that we can go back at some point to one of these two models. This is the reality of modern science communication, if we like it or not. And I think it certainly has its upsides. Um, let me just show you one way in which this lack of a communication monopoly works out. And some of you have seen these things for GMOs in particular. This is effective science communication. Why is this effective science communication? Tony the Frankentiger, genetically modified fakes. Um, the reason frosted fakes, the reason why it's so successful is because I haven't given you a single piece of information, yet you immediately understand what I'm trying to tell you. You immediately understand what the message is when I tell you Franken food, frosted fakes, um, and so on and so forth. Why? Because I, because I play to an image that's in your mind. Because I play to an image that's, that, that, that we all, a, a mental schema that we all have. Um, and of course, the interesting thing, even when the Atlantic Monthly writes a fairly positive piece on, on GMOs, the Franken food and the stitched up carrot, um, again, provide that same shortcut. What is that shortcut? It's framing. It's what we in communication call framing. Basically goes back to Nobel Prize winning work in psychology by Dan Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, and, and Amos Tversky, who uh, won a Nobel Prize in 2002 in economics for this, um, and ba basically said every piece of information is reference dependent. So what I already told you, it depends on your prior beliefs and so on. And science, unfortunately, especially issues like GMOs, are, are, are issues that are, that are really highly ambiguous in most people's minds. They may be safe. They may not be safe. They may you know, be corporate sponsored push, they may, be, uh, they may be feeding the world. There are different ways of looking at the exact same issue. 
Why is that so important? Well, because this is what GMOs are in, in people's minds. This is research from the 50s. Very simple, very elegant experimental work. They basically said, I'm going to give you this, what's called the broken bee stimulus. Meaning it could be a one and a three, or it could be a bee, doesn't matter. Well, it does matter depending on which experimental group you're in. If you're in this experimental group, I'm embedding this ambiguous stimulus in a set of letters. And in your head, you're significantly more likely to see the one and a three or the broken bee as a letter. If you're in this group, I'm embedding it into a set of numbers, um, meaning I'm activating or I'm, I'm using your, your number schema, and as a result, you're interpreting this as a number. Why is this result so, so fascinating? Because it explains the Frankenfood one. Because it basically says framing, are ex or framing is an extremely important tool to help audiences, and this is not a, a, a manipulative tool. It's actually a, a, a tool in, that we use to make sense of the weird broken bees out there, of the weird types of things that we don't fully understand because we're not trained scientists. Because we didn't learn these things for 10, 20 years like a small group of society, but we still have to make policy choices about them. So frames help us determine why an issue matters, why it's important, why should I as a, as a, as a consumer, as a citizen care? Why, does it, why is, is GMO is important and also helps us effectively process highly complex information by attaching it to cognitive schemas that we already have. So we all use it and it's crucially important for communication and Greenpeace has discovered this early on or has known this for a long time. The tricky part of course is um, it also can have effects that are, that are uh, maybe unintended and if you look at some of the very first, this is one of our case studies that we'll talk about, this was coverage back in 1999. Um, on, the, uh, on the, the, the BT corn controversy, and this is really the, the, the beauty of this, of this headline. Um, the Bambi of insects, the biotech versus the Bambi of insects. Why is this so powerful? Because that Bambi frame is, is, is just the, the perfect cognitive schema to activate. If you, you're killing off Bambi with biotech, right? This is why it's so powerful, because basically, <coughs> this is what we all have in our head. This is, this is what it plays to. It doesn't give me any additional information. And again, I'm not suggesting that the, the Washington Post was trying to, to, to manipulate public opinion in any way. It's just a great headline. But it's also a headline that activates underlying frames. And once that frame is established, the Frankenfood frame or the, the Bambi of butterflies or whatever frame, it's very difficult to get rid of. Um, John Holdren tried to do this on, on global climate change when he went to OSTP and said we need to call it global climate disruption because that captures the idea better. Climate change is not the right frame. Um, and he got hammered immediately by Fox News um, saying you're, you're trying to reframe the issue for political gain. Be that as it may, um, <laughs> it, it's, it, you know, and, and, and the credibility of, the, of, the, of those critiquing him a different issue, but, but, the, but basically, uh, you know, that frame never changed and it, and it will continue uh, that way. The last thing also that I will, that I will leave you with, there's also no such thing as unframed information. So the idea, and I know we all have the tendency to go back to the saying, well, look, it, we, can, we just need to get neutral information out. There is no neutral information. When we write NSF grants, they're transformative. Um, and they're transformative because we know that otherwise they're not going to, they're not incremental because otherwise they're not going to get funded. When you submit a piece to science, it's a piece that says this is absolutely novel, this is, has broad implications, this is not focused on a narrow field. You will use particular adjectives. Unless it's framed in a particular way, it's not going to get published in science. So all of us frame our information all the time. In fact, that is, as I mentioned, good information. The ability to, uh, to allow 325 million Americans who know little about the issue to connect it meaningfully to their daily lives and connect not just the science but the policy implications, the legal, the ethical issues surrounding it meaningfully to their daily lives, unless we manage to do this in an effective way, and by effective I mean in a half sentence, in a, in a, in a, in a way that I, when, as I read the paper, as I look through my tablet over during breakfast, unless we manage to do this, we're not going to be able to, to really build successful public interfaces. So this is where today and tomorrow, I think, um, hopefully, will come in um, and, and, and help us along that. Um, again, there's a large body of social science literature, and I put um, 
Um, a, a, a quick plug in here for the National Academy is the two special issue of PNAS that have come out on the science of science communication. A number of people in this room have contributed to those volumes that summarizes some of that social scientific research. What do we know about public interfaces? What do we know about um, the, the, the science, the, really the social science of science communication rather than the winging it part? Um, and so we know a lot about how these things work. But the tricky part is, and this is why this workshop is so crucially important, these things differ across different issues. Uh, nano is very, very different and has played out very, very differently, nanotechnology has, than GMOs have. Um, if you look at synthetic biology survey data, you already see elements of biotech popping up in terms of how the public reacts. Um, the ethical, legal, social implications for all of these issues are different. Um, the political uh, uh, communication environments are, are different. Certainly, if you look at Germany versus France uh, versus even some of the differences across states in the U.S., uh, the ones that have had um, um, ballot initiatives, for instance, versus the ones who have. So GMOs are probably one of the more complex examples that we have for, for public interfaces. Um, and hopefully the next day and a half will, will uh, allow us to, um, to uh, sort this out. I wanted to end with information on the, on the round table. If you haven't seen it, um, um, please uh, visit the web page if you can and, and also feel free to contact one of the two uh, co-chairs and, and Cynthia's here um, um, or Keegan or myself um, for any additional questions. Um, I think we have maybe one or two Time for one or two quick questions, if, if there are any on what I've said. Um, and uh, while we're doing that, if I could ask Bill to come up so we can get ready for the, for the next talk. Thank you so much. And let me ask you to please take seats in the, in the front. There we go. Thank you, Bill. Can figure out how to make the screen so Thank you. Oh. What's with the screen? Oh, there we go. Okay. Are there any questions really quickly? Hi, Dieter. Mary Woolley with Research America, and thank you for an extraordinarily clear presentation. I just thought it was excellent. Um, I want to go back to the very beginning and ask you to expand a little bit on that concept of, uh, you called it post-normal science. And, and can you tell us a little bit about where that comes from and who's using that terminology um, and how it, uh, in, especially with the public and political context yeah. in mind. Yeah. And, um, and there's a number of people, I think, in the room um, who are at least as, as qualified to talk about this as, as I am. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the concept comes from what I would broadly label science and technology studies, so STS. Um, and I think I have the, the, the site up there. If not, I will email it to you. Um, so you have it, but, um, but the idea really being that, that we're dealing with a set of scientific issues that are defined in part by their scientific complexity, but also acknowledging the fact that they're increasingly defined by how they end up playing out in policy environments. Um, and so the idea that, that the system's uncertainty is not just uncertainty that surrounds the science. You know, do we know everything about, about the human health impacts, the environmental impacts, but also the systems uncertainties about what that will do to other, to <coughs> economic systems. And I think we've seen, uh, certainly surrounding GMOs, some of the debates, uh, you know, what will they do to farmers? What will they do to, to, uh, um, to the dynamic between corporations and farmers? So in other words, the uncertainties go well beyond the science and, and really into the political system. Um, and then at the same time, of course, the stakes in terms of investment, and I think nanotechnology is a great example where you see the large chemical firms investing, you know, 80, 90 percent of their R&D budget in, in, in nano-related applications. Some of them do. Um, so extremely high stakes if that goes south, if that doesn't end up um, playing out as an, in, as an investment. Um, but I, I'll, I'll make sure that I put the, uh, the citation up there as well. Go ahead. Uh, Bob Goldberg, UCLA. Uh, thank you for a very informative uh, presentation. The question I really have is how do you unframe ideological framing that's based on scientific untruths? And that's particularly, I think, the difference between nanotechnology and GMO in the public discussion. Very different. So two, two things in your question that are interesting. One is how do you unframe? And um, it's the, the interesting question is to which degree you can unframe. And, and I would suggest that you know, once you have a really good frame established, it's difficult to reverse that. Um, what does that mean? That means two things. A, that 
you really have to think early on about how you frame an issue as a, from a scientific community. Um, how you present it, how you present the, the, or how you frame it in a way that allows people to attach it to what they know, how they understand science. So, um, and I don't think we've done that at all. Um, that's, and I think that's number one, that you need to think about it early on. Um, and I think number two is if you try to counterframe or if you, and counterframe is the wrong word because there's really, it's not that we're trying to engage in a battle, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to then offer a, 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 let's say a positive frame, right, or a, a frame that, that convinces. For GMOs, I would venture to say that if, if I had to come up in two sentences what the problems are that people have with GMOs, I, have, I, I can easily do that. If I try to, in a half sentence or again two sentences, come up with what has been the, the consistent message out of the scientific community, why GMOs are important and important investment, I have a much harder time doing that. Um, and the reason being that it has been, it ha that message has been framed and developed much less concisely and much less consistently. And I think that's part of, has always been part of our problem. I'm not saying the message is not there, or I'm not saying the, the arguments are not there, but for 325 million Americans, they have been much less visible and much less concisely framed. Um, and, and so as a result, uh, I think the value proposition of, 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 of GMOs has not been communicated in a, in a particularly good way. Um, and I'd, I'll have to leave it at that, mostly to not cut into Bill's time all that much. Thank you again.